Uh, this won't be of interest to uh, <laughs> a lot of people, but to the people who are interested in these things, it would probably be kind of fascinating. I uh, kind of would explain uh, the name of my channel, too, because <laughs> I deal with these a lot, or I have in the past. What this is, something I picked up yesterday in town, uh, there's a long story that goes with it, but this is an old union loom. Uh, they were made uh, back in the 20s. You could buy them out of the Sears catalog for around 50 bucks. And they came assembled and with like 10 yards of work on them. So you could buy one and start weaving that day, you know, they were, and they were a, a good design in that, like a door of that size, you can tip them on end and with that X frame, you can wiggle them through the door. You know, we brought one in through a door exactly like this, we brought this one in. I'm over at my brother's uh, for the simple reason that this loom has been repainted or painted. I, I don't know why anybody would ever do that, but it's something people did. You know, they're good. I believe it's walnut, or not walnut, but maple is what they're made of. But then somebody went and put this kind of a, I don't know what you call it, kind of a fuchsia or pink kind of paint over it, which is ugly the thing up. You know, this was done years ago, but you can see where the paint is worn off. It's really nice wood underneath. You know, I, I don't know what possesses people to do this, but they, they have done it to a lot of old furniture. Well, there's kind of a long involved story with this, but I, I used to, I dealt with these a lot. Uh, I have several looms and I have um, passed several looms on to people. What happened years ago, this is like 20 years ago, I used to demonstrate in a, a local pioneer village. They had a couple of looms in there. And when they had their shindig, uh, me and my mom and my sister would go down there and we would fire up their old looms. And the idea was that we would get kids, you know, that were coming through, let them weave on them, you know, because they can take it. They're made to take a beating. Well, there was a family in town that their, uh, the mother taught piano and she had three daughters that would come down there and she would play piano and sing during this shindig. And the one daughter was always fascinated by the loom. You know, you just see her, uh, she was shy and quiet, but she really was interested in a, in a loom. And so we finally got her to weave on it. Well, oh man, she really got into it, you know. So it was kind of, it was funny because, like I said, we always have kids weaving. And once she got going on it, like she was a kind of a shy, quiet person, but when she got going on it, then she would get other kids to come and do it, to weave on it, you know, and she enjoyed teaching them what she had learned. And it worked out really well, and she really enjoyed it every year. She looked forward to coming and doing that. Well, then her mother talked to me one time and asked if I couldn't find a loom that they could give her for a birthday present. And like I said, I've been through looms, past looms on all the time, because uh, I used to do shows. During the summers, I would do like a dozen different shows and I had my old loom that I still have that I brought with me at all these shows. So I had people coming up all the time and saying, oh, you need another loom. I got a loom I want to get rid of. When I'd have people coming up and asking, where can I find a loom? So I always kept a list of people looking for looms and people who had looms they wanted to get rid of. Well. So this, when she asked me about a loom, I, I checked and there was one that I, somebody had, and I don't exactly remember where I got this one from. 
but I think I gave him like a hundred bucks for it. You know, when it was already, it was painted like this. And uh, otherwise it was in good solid working order and all the stuff was with it, you know, shuttles and everything. So it worked out good. So I got that loom and gave it to her and then she gave it to her kid. And our kid wove on this thing a bunch of rugs because what it was, they, they owned a resort and then some of the girls worked at the resort, <laughs> but then she was able to sell the rugs that she made at the resort and she made a little money doing this. But like I said, that was years ago. Well, that girl is long growing up and I think she's moved up to Alaska like eight years ago or something and lives up there and she didn't take the loom with her. I got a call from the mother the other day that they were moving and selling their house and they wanted to get rid of the loom but they didn't want it. You know, they didn't just want to trash it or donate it to some outfit and figure out, you know, what would happen to it. So she called me. So I ran into town yesterday to pick this up. Well, the thing hasn't been used for a while now. And it's a little tangly back here, you know, <laughs> that happens. There's a few broke strings, but I'm, I'm figuring them out as I tie it on. Like right here, I know there's one missing, but I have an extra one that I think belongs there. So I, you just have to sort it out and make sure none of them are crossed and stuff. But my intention originally when I picked up this loom before that woman wanted it for her kid, my thought was, okay, I hate to see this paint on, I was going to get it and strip all this paint off. You know, take it completely apart, strip this paint off, get it back down to the pure wood and varnish like it's supposed to be. Well, I had actually, you know, after she got it and I, I didn't think any more of it until she called me again, I thought, okay, I, I should do that now. Fix this one up, bring it back to the original. But it has enough warp on to do maybe a half dozen rugs. Although it's a little tangly, like I say, I can get that straightened out. I've done a lot of that. So I brought it over to my sister-in-law's, my brother's place. She's got some old rugs, you know, the, uh, you know, this sort of thing. You know, rag rugs, it's a Scandinavian thing. She's got some of them that uh, the string is wearing out on, so she wants to reweave them. So I thought, okay, she can reweave her rugs on this to use this warp up, and then I'll completely tear it down and, and redo it. They're a very good loom. They're uh, rather simple, but for somebody starting out, they're, they're a very good loom. Uh, I like, I've got a couple of new combs, and that's where I learned on my mom had a new comb, which my sister uses now. And my mom still weaves, and what she has is an Orco, which is really a new production or newer production made like in the 70s, but a reproduction of the old Union looms. Same design, but not built with the, the nice hardwood and stuff. You know, they were made cheaper, but I think they were selling for like two or three hundred dollars. But loom prices can go kind of odd, but I figure any kind of loom that that you can actually get together and get working is worth around a hundred is what I was figuring. But you'll see them go, like at auction sales, they can go really high if you got people looking for them. But that's what used to work good when I had a list of people who were looking and people who wanted to get rid of. You know, it, it saved people a lot of money that way. And it got the looms into hands where they would get used. You know, because that was, like say, when I, we used to do it at that uh, Pioneer Village to demonstrate I quit doing that after a while. They, they kept changing directors and, and pretty soon, you know, the whole theory of, of how this thing was being run 
had changed. It was, you know, they were going more to the, you know, instead of hands-on stuff, they, they put up video terminals and, you know, museums tend to do that. Uh, where my theory always was, you know, kids learn by working on things, touching things. And most of the stuff, you know, it's a hundred years old anyway, it survived because it can take a beating. But that's just the, the tendency of museums to go that way. But a lot of kids had a lot of fun on, well, on them looms and on also, you know, like the old one that I would bring to shows, uh, part of the thing, I would weave all the time at the shows then. And I would also have kids come and weave. Uh, the one time on my old one, I had three little girls that were really too short to be weaving, but that one has a bench built in. So there were two little girls on the sides that were doing the pounding, and one little girl in the middle with her jaw right about here that was running the pedals. It was quite an operation, but they had a really good time doing it. But it's nice if they can do that hands-on kind of thing. But, like I say, society tends to get away from that. But, anyway, so I haul this loom home, and now once I get this all untangled, she can reweave her rugs, and then I'll, I'll strip it down and, and do the work on it. But if somebody's looking for an old loom, a, a good thing to keep an eye out is for these, these old Union ones, because they are a pretty basic but very solidly built loom because they were made for weaving rugs. You know, a, a lot of times, you know, like at the time, yeah, they'd ship them in one piece. Uh, I know a lot of my ma's new comb, when that came, it actually came on the train and it was in several pieces. I went with to pick it up at the depot, but that was a much more complex loom. But these were simple enough that they could be shipped in one piece with warp on them, which was fantastic, you know. But now, the looms that they make, they're always concerned about shipping, so they make them really too light for making rugs. They're, you can weave little tapestry and little placemats and stuff like that, but these were made heavy enough, designed to take the beating that a, a rug loom takes. Now, like I said, I used to do shows all the time, and, and I'm probably going to be getting back into that more because I've got a lot of material to use up, and I still have a bunch of looms. And so there'll probably be more videos on the weaving. I, I don't want to start doing shows again, but my, like my sister's still doing shows and weaves, and my mother still weaves, and we've been sending rugs with my sister, you know, that way. But if I do, I'll probably do online sales again. I've done a lot of that too. So rather than start monkeying and doing the shows again, because that just got to be a lot of driving because I, I was doing North Dakota, Minnesota and some in Wisconsin. Although, you know, the, the thing is, like these rag rugs are really like a Scandinavian sort of thing. So you have to be in an area where there's Scandinavians. I know I sold one time to a tourist that was out of California. You wanted a rug? Well, he said, well, no, I think I'll hang it on a wall. Well, yeah, they really weren't made to hang on a wall. They were made to go on the floor, but you know, it doesn't really matter what they do with them. But I tended, and my sisters tended to do this too now, and go more into the wool rugs. You know, I, I was doing like 90% of what I was doing at the end there. Well, I shouldn't say and, uh, but when I quit doing shows, I was doing mostly wool because that's what my customers wanted because, you know, it was hard to sell them. At first, they didn't want to buy wool. People were hesitant. They think, oh, well, you know, they want cotton that they can wash. You know, that you're dealing, you got to right, find your right customer base. And I, I know what mine is. I, I got that down to a science. And... They aren't the Walmart shoppers. They're, they're people who actually have better taste than that. It's partly why I never really 
uh, push the rug thing on YouTube, you know, although my channel says that, uh, you know, the log cabin looms, I, I never really, because the YouTube people really aren't my customer base, that, that's a different bunch. Uh, I think they would be people who would be more interested in, in weaving, but not so much in the buying rugs, you know. Though I have sold some to people that, uh, that's from the YouTube thing. But I'm not into the merch, you know. But eventually, like I say, I'll, I will start putting some more on, uh, probably on Etsy, though I really kind of got burned on Etsy or disappointed when they went public, the whole aspect of them changed. You know, it used to be a lot more of the handmade, uh, by you stuff, and the rules kind of loosened up when they went public, so I don't know. Uh, I'll think about that, but I can always do eBay. Or, but it always aggravates me that there's always, with whatever outfit you're dealing with, you're always dealing with somebody who wants a piece of your money. You know, like even in doing the shows, it constantly you're, you're dealing with the tax outfit and you're dealing with, you know, the, with the sales tax and you're, you know, there's a lot of paperwork involved in this more than it should be. You know, it. You're, you're taking something, making something you should be able to sell without all those headaches in there. And even uh, a lot of the shows, well, not so much for me, but, uh, you know, because I was doing more of the shows that were with the arts councils and stuff. And a lot of times they didn't give me free spaces, but a lot of the, the craft type shows were getting real outrageous on their fees for people to set up, you know, which was unfortunate. And I kind of, you know, it was a lot, it was hard for a lot of people. I mean, if you're really making something, it's hard to have that much overhead. Um, so a lot of those turned into really you know, a lot of people reselling other people's stuff, a lot of import stuff, you know, it just got to be a mess. But uh, like I said, I was dealing most with the arts councils and there, they were a lot more strict about who they would let in. You know, they, they watched it a lot closer. The other ones, a lot of they just didn't care. You know, anybody, that, you could sell anything that anybody made as long as they got their money. That's what they were concerned about. But I'll go back to work. But there'll probably be some more uh, stuff about looms. I, I know I have some subscribers that have requested more information on looms. Ah, there's it. A nice snarl I'll have to deal with, but uh, at least here you're dealing with, you know, when you're dealing with sectionally warped looms, you know there's 24 strings in each section. <laughs> so as long as you can keep 24 and that they aren't twisted, yeah, there's two strings that are broke. Well, that's not too bad, too. Uh, this is what gets intimidating to people who aren't used to it. But like I say, I've done this quite a little. Uh, in fact, I had one time, one time, that I had a loom set up, and I actually had a dog that jumped up on top of the loom, broke through the strings, tangled them all up, broke. That was a nightmare. And this isn't so bad, you know. I've got a few broken strings that I can deal with. Just tie in, pull them through. But the whole purpose of doing it this way is just I don't want to waste that work. Because work has got to be expensive, uh, much more so. I know when my mom first started weaving, like these are the spools, but these are almost used up. A new spool is about eh, that big around. They used to be, I, I know at one time she was buying for like a quarter. They went up to 50 cents and that was like a dollar. Well, now you're looking at five or six dollars per spool, and it takes 24 spools to load it, you know, so it, it adds up. So the prices have to go up, but then, like I say, you're dealing at the shows, you have to, you have to find your customer base because you can't get what you have to get out of them from the Walmart shoppers, you know, the people who are, are buying the imports and don't know the difference between a really well-made rug and something that you buy at, like at Menards for 99 cents. You know, there's a world of difference there. 
but if you don't know better, you know, so you got to you got to deal with the people who know better. And uh, I met a lot of really nice people at the shows, uh, doing the shows, really nice customers who had really excellent taste, met a lot of really nice vendors, other people that had set up there, especially in the Arts Council ones, met some really nice people. And I do miss the shows from that aspect of it, but it was just a lot of driving, uh, more than I care to do, and a lot of work setting up, and, and especially with me taking the loom along, you know, it was, it was work. And cut into the other things I want to do because I have too many other interests to, to spend a lot of time doing that. Well, I'm pretty near got her halfway where I want to be. So she's doable. But then I can get her, get her weaving and get her to get the, the warp used up and then I'll just strip her down completely. They're not that hard to work on if you've done it. But a lot of times, like people say, uh, <laughs> they'll have a loom in pieces, all taken apart, and they're never sure if all the pieces are there. Well, I, I can tell really very quickly looking at the, the pile of parts, and usually when I bought looms that are in a pile of parts, what you find is that there are a lot of parts in there that don't belong with the loom, that people you know, it's laying in the garage, I don't know what it is, it must go with the loom, so they throw it in that pile. I got a hell of a lot of curtain stretchers that way. You know, I mean, there is that temple thing that some people use, where drugs, you really don't use them, but they made curtain stretchers that look similar to that. I ended up with a lot of them pokey things, but I, I, like I say, I've been through a lot of looms. I, I still have quite a few looms. And I never pass up an opportunity to get them because, like I say, I can always find people who are looking for looms. I don't have a union at the moment, so I'll probably keep this one, you know, after I get it refinished. Because a plain union two harnesses is a kind of a nice thing to have, though I will probably double slay it rather than single slay. I like that better for making rugs. Uh, well, it'd be hard to explain. I can show you. I got samples here, but it's it's. The strings are doubled, but spaced twice as far apart as they are normally to a, a regular reed. You know, you, you, the reed here is, is what does the packing and it separates the strings and you get different pitches in there. So many threads per inch, I think this is a 12. But, you know, you can run a coarser reed or a finer reed, or you can double slay and then skip every other one. And that works better. That's what I'm doing on Ma's Orco loom. I've had that set up that way. But for most of my weaving, I use the four harness new combs, because like I said, I've got two of them. I like the way they work. Uh, the pattern can make a heavier, longer lasting rug. It works particularly well with the wool. So I do a lot of those. But I'll be doing more. Like I say, this probably isn't a lot of interest to a lot of people, <laughs> but to a few people, you may find this interesting. But I like to see, you know, there's fewer people, and you know, this is the kind of thing that comes and goes. Uh, there aren't as many people getting into weaving as they used to be. You know, and there was a time when it was a popular thing, though there are still weavers guilds like in Minneapolis and stuff, and, and uh, there's certainly a demand for the rugs if you get your right customer base, you know, and, and like I say, it, it takes that. In fact, uh, my sister always laughs because now what she's dealing with is my old customers. The shows that she goes to, she always runs into people who who talk about buying rugs from me, you know, and she has to laugh and tell them that, yeah, that was her brother. And then a lot of times, like I say, I send rugs with her, and then they're always tickled and buy another of my rugs. Because once you get somebody into the wool ones, uh, that's all they want. You know, you have a steady customer. And also, I have found, you know, a lot of people have the good taste to buy, you know, you don't, 
what I used to hate, like people would order rugs and they'd say, oh, I want five of them all matching of, of like different sizes. They were gonna lay them out in their house that way. They're, that's not my kind of customer. That's kind of your Walmart customer. What I like is people who have the taste to get to, to buy, you know, each individual thing should stand on its own merits, but complement the others. I know I had one customer that was just amazing. She would come when I do a show, it was in Minnesota, but she would buy like a half dozen rugs and she knew, you know, she had really good taste. She, she'd pile them up and boom, that was what she wanted, you know, and they were all different, but they all complemented each other. They worked well together, but she had excellent taste, but uh, that's kind of a rarity, but it's great when you find those, when you find, you know, it, it makes you feel good when you find somebody who appreciates what you're doing and, and understands how things don't have to all be the same. You know, you don't have to coordinate them. They can complement each other. Ah, I'm rambling on. I got work to do here.